So thank you all for um, joining us this afternoon for a great talk on um, population health in Maryland. We have some great speakers lined up. Um, and I'm going to kick it right off by introducing our first speaker. We've had a little bit of change of program. We're going to lead off with Dr. David Mann. Um, David um, received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School in 1982. Um, he later went on to get a PhD in epidemiology in my own department, in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, since 2006, he has been both a part-time faculty member in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, as well as an epidemiologist in the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. David's research interests include diabetes, smoking cessation, telemedicine, and pre preventive medicine, and he is going to talk with us today about health enterprise, health enterprise zones. So please give a warm welcome to David. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the Health Enterprise Zones today. And uh, <clears throat> those of you who may have seen me speak somewhere else before know I kind of go through slides quickly, so I often start by saying, fasten your seatbelt and don't blink. Uh, so we'll get right into it. So basically, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the background and evolution of the Health Enterprise Zones, what the concept in, of it was and how we got to awarding specific zones spend a lot of time on the goals and strategies and the high utilizer identification and targeting elements, and then some relevance to other statewide initiatives if time permits to get into those elements. So I'll start by saying that Maryland's actually a pretty uh, racially diverse state, 45% uh, minority back in the 2010 census, and we're at 47.5% minority now. We expect to be 50% minority by 2018 most likely, and certainly by the 2020 census, so it's a big issue for Maryland. Disparities by racial and ethnic group, I'm not going to go into every one of these, but this is just to illustrate that all of our racial and ethnic minority populations have certain areas where their outcomes are worse than the non-Hispanic white population. Uh, it's different but for different groups in different health domains, but at least we can see that everybody has some issues we have to deal with. And that sets the stage for the next few slides just talking about black-white disparities because that's where our data tends to be strongest. Here what's interesting is looking at some... Uh, if we get a pointer to work here. Looking at uh, some of the disparities we see in our SHIP metrics, the state health improvement process, the disparity rate ratios for some of the mortality rates, heart disease and cancer, are relatively low. And for some of the uh, behaviors, uh, healthy weight and smoking, again, relatively small differences. But for utilization in the emergency department, diabetes, hypertension, and asthma emergency department visit rates, very large disparities. So what you'll start to see is a theme about how the utilization rate disparities are some of the largest ones we have in the state and also can pretty much directly equate to certain cost issues. So this looks at the same kind of issue. Here it's just describing uh, some admission rate differences from uh, data around 2011 that we had for our health disparities work group report. And you can see that for various uh, ambulatory care sensitive conditions, dramatically higher rates of uh, hospitalization for blacks compared to whites. If we think about how that translates into dollars, we can see that uh, this is based on uh, an extrapolation of some data from a study from Hopkins that looked at data from 2006 to, 2000, 2003 to 2006. Uh, in Maryland, we probably have about one to two billion dollars every year of uh, uh, health disparities costs just in the direct medical cost domain. And if we Analysis we did back in 2011 looking at excess charges uh, due to the black versus white hospitalization disparities uh, accounted for about $814 million, and that was just the hospital charges element, not including the physician charges, emergency department, or outpatient costs. So a lot of money we could potentially save if we could get health disparities right in the state. So HEZs evolved out of a health disparities work group that was convened by Maryland's uh, health uh, Quality and Cost Council back in 2011. It was chaired by Dean Reese from the medical school, had a lot of different experts on minority health around the table from lots of different uh, health service sectors. Uh, my office, uh, myself and our then director, Dr. Carlisa Hussein, were the staff for the work group and we actually co-drafted the final report, uh, taking the ideas that had come out of the discussion, fleshing it out with some of the operational elements. 
The report recommended three things, health enterprise zones, a Maryland Health Innovation Prize, which is an interesting idea in search of a funder still, and racial and ethnic tracking of uh, healthcare delivery performance. So that turned into, in the 2012 session, the Maryland Health Improvement and Disparities Reduction Act of 2012, which had in it the health enterprise zones, which is what everyone tends to think of about that act, but also had several other elements, uh, mostly talking about how we get data collection involved with uh, the two other commissions, the Maryland Healthcare Commission, the Health Services Cost Review Commission, uh, get it into hospitals, into patient-centered medical homes, and get some reporting out of health education institutions on what their efforts were to address health disparities. So the statute, in terms of what it said about health enterprise zones, basically laid out, laid out four uh, <clears throat> health improvement strategies to deploy. Increasing uh, healthcare provider capacity, and that actually got a lot of attention with uh, tax incentives and loan repayment incentives, things of that sort. Improving health services delivery generally, uh, affecting community improvements, and conducting outreach and education to uh, disadvantaged populations. Also in the legislation were some health outcome expectations. Number one, to improve health outcomes generally to reduce health disparities, and although not stated so in the legislation, implicitly improve minority health. Those aren't always the same thing, but that's another lecture. And reduce health costs and hospital admissions and readmissions, which was actually the one hard outcome that we were tasked to do in the legislation. So a lot of what we've modeled is gonna be based on trying to move that metric. So why utilization as a key health outcome to focus on? If you think about trying to work in areas that are as small as one or two zip codes, uh, utilization might be the only metrics that meet the criteria of being cheap because they're already being collected by Health Services Cost Review Commission, so they're available. Maybe they're statistically stable at these small community levels compared to a lot of other metrics because the N of the events you're looking at can be fairly large. And maybe the only metrics that you're going to get a big response in four years. I mean, mortality and, and prevalence probably takes a long time to, to move. So that was one of the reasons we had a big focus on utilization outcome metrics. So who was eligible to be a health enterprise zone? So the zones were defined in the legislation as a contiguous geographic area of one or more zip codes. It had to be experiencing documented poor health outcomes and health disparities and uh, needed to have documented uh, economic disadvantage. So to operationalize that once the legislation was written, we assessed all the zip codes in Maryland based on whether they were in the bottom 50% or not on one of two poverty metrics, that was WIC enrollment and Medicaid enrollment and in the bottom 50% on one of two poor health metrics, that was life expectancy and low birth weight rates. And the incentives that were in the legislation uh, included uh, state income tax credits for providers, hiring tax credits if they were expanding an office, uh, grants for equipment purchase or lease, and loan repayment assistance programs, all of this designed to help bring providers into underserved areas. And to get those uh, benefits, we wrote in that you had to participate in cultural competency training, accept Medicaid and see uninsured patients and participate with the coordinating organization that was overseeing the health enterprise zone. Community level interventions, which were a really important uh, parallel to the provider incentives, uh, basically grants available for things like deploying community health workers, increasing fresh fruits and vegetables in a neighborhood, uh, safe physical activity, transportation assistance programs. Uh, one zone actually created a bus route that links residential areas with physicians' offices with grocery stores as a way to try to help get people to all the things that they need. Uh, mobile crisis teams, which one of the uh, health enterprise zones has deployed, uh, cultural competency training, and then supporting community coalitions. So we had some elements from our minority health logic model that we've used in our office for years that we were able to incorporate into the health enterprise zones and those were the uh, focus on cultural, linguistic, and health literacy competency, uh, workforce diversity, outreach to and targeting of minority populations, which we think is really important both in planning and in actually deploying interventions, racial, ethnic, and language data collection and reporting so you really can see what's the problem and how well we're doing to fix it, addressing social determinants of health, and for HEZs in particular, having a balance between the provider focus and the community focus. It was potentially easy with all the tax credits to get really focused on the provider half and ignore the community half, we tried to make sure that that didn't happen in the applications we got. So the health enterprise zones that we ended up funding were uh, one in uh, West Baltimore, and that's, uh, if I can get this to work, that's centered out of Bon Secours. Uh, Anne Arundel County, this one is actually 
centered in a particular uh, elderly housing complex that had a really high rate of 911 calls, and so they built a, a clinic in the first floor of that building. Uh, county here in Prince George's County, or excuse me, a zip code in Prince George's County, uh, also an area of a few zip codes in St. Mary's, and then a very large swath of Dorchester with a little piece of Carolyn County involved. So to think about how we tried to operationalize this concept and actually make this work, one of the ways we thought about it was a recipe for success in public health might be expressed as doing enough of the right things for the right people. So if we've got the right idea of what to do, that kind of gets us out of the right things. Doing enough, I think, has always been the problem with limited resources, but if you can do it for the right people, the enough number gets to be smaller. I think you'll see that as we go through this a little bit further. So this is a, a model that we actually use for a slightly different program we're doing in our office, but it applies here a bit. And so if you think about the steps to successful chronic disease management, if you're really looking at reducing uh, hospital utilization and ED utilization where that's preventable, it's really about chronic disease management. First, you've got to have health insurance and be able to afford your co-pays and all of those things. But even with that, you have to find a provider who takes your insurance. You have to what I call a willing provider. Then you have to be able to get to that provider. Either transportation has to be there, they have to have hours that you can uh, meet given your job schedule. And this is all about how you get in the door. Then once you're in the door, you need a good patient-provider interaction. You've got to get the provider to give you the correct evidence-based treatment plan, so that's provider quality. And then you leave the doctor's office, and then you're not done yet. You have to be able to carry out your treatment plan at home. And I think an awful lot of preventable utilization may come from gaps here. And so if you think about what happens when you don't have these things, people here might use the ED for primary care if they can't even get into primary care or they end up getting delayed care and they end up having crisis use of the emergency room in the hospital, which is what we're trying to avoid. In this side, patients come out of the doctor's office, but they might have poor disease control. They have decompensation that could be preventable, and that lands them in the ED in the hospital again. So the kind of things we can do to support them, you know, linking people to our exchange with the Affordable Care Act, connector entities and navigators, trying to get newly insured persons and, and previously insured persons linked to medical homes if they're not already. Uh, help educate them on optimal use of their insurance so they're actually using primary care and not the ED all the time. And dealing with transportation barriers if that's a big issue. And here we think linking insured persons to case management and community health worker services to help support their self-management at home once they've actually had their primary care visits. So this is a slightly different version of the uh, HEZ logic model. It's probably the first uh, first model that we started to use to talk to the zones as we were trying to get them a little more aligned in, in really focusing on this avoidable utilization outcome. So here we have an increase in care capacity, which is what the, all the tax incentives in, this, in the health enterprise zone legislation do. Uh, once you get provider utilization, you'd obviously like the care quality to be good. We didn't actually have specific interventions in the zones to improve quality, but that's certainly a requirement for this all to work. And then Patient self-management capability after they leave the doctor's office, probably the big key to getting to the goal of reducing preventable utilization. And then the self-management at home is, is influenced a lot by community-wide enabling interventions. So if people need to exercise, need to have better diets, you've got to have those things available in the community. So we had grants to try to promote some of those things. And then finally, this is my most recent model of the process, but I think might be my favorite, most favorite one. Uh, it kind of breaks the process into the access to primary care step, the clinical encounter quality step, and the self-care execution at home step. You can see you need to be able to get the insurance to pay for it, but you've got to have the available provider. Both of those feed in here. You need the effective patient provider communication and the evidence-based treatment plan uh, to work in this clinical encounter quality element. And then two levels in the self-care execution at home. What are the personal assets you need to pull this off? And what are the community assets that you need to pull this off? If you think about what we did with HEZ interventions, they map in this fashion onto this model. So that uh, where cultural, linguistic, and health literacy competency uh, flows into the effective patient provider coordination, we did the HEZ cultural competency training programs, uh, access to primary care to the extent that we're focusing on HEZ discharge care coordination, we're making sure people leaving the hospital in the ED are getting back to primary care. Uh, to make sure there are available providers. We had the provider incentives, all the tax credits and the uh, loan repayment incentives and things of that sort. 
grants to the community help to build the community assets that were required for the self-care execution element and the health enterprise zone uh, community health workers working one-on-one -on -one with patients in a uh, longitudinal relationship with people in their homes to help them uh, overcome the barriers they have to successful uh, self-management. So I want to spend a minute talking about the notion of high utilizer focusing. Uh, this kind of comes from the work of uh, Dr. Brenner at Camden Coalition, kind of perhaps the, the foster of all this stuff. But when we're thinking of how do we get impact with limited resources on those utilization metrics at the level of the whole uh, set of zip codes, we're obviously going to have the greatest impact if we can succeed with the high utilizers. So an interesting analysis from CRISP, our health information exchange, on the PG Health Enterprise Zone, which is a single zip code, admissions over two years revealed that the top 10% of high users accounted for 30% of all the admissions and 78% of all the readmissions, and that was 269 people. So when you say, well, how do I reach thousands and thousands of people, suddenly I only have to reach 269 people, or maybe just 200. Maybe some of them are going to get better on their own without us that suddenly becomes very much more feasible and doable with the kind of resources we have in place. So I think that's one of the reasons why the high, util high utilizer identification strategy is, is really fundamental. So it gets us back to our recipe for success. Can we do enough of the right things for the right people? So I think we've got the right, whoops, get to my pointer here. Uh, I think we've got the right logic model for what we want to do, all the different steps. Uh, if we can do enough, have a good productivity in all those uh, interventions that we're deploying, and if we can deliver it to these high utilizers, I think we've got a good chance of making gains in those outcome metrics that we're interested in. So just a couple slides more to talk about uh, where this model might fit into other initiatives. Uh, I'll talk mostly about patient-centered medical home and community-integrated medical home. I think Dr. Sharfstein will probably be talking about the CMS waiver in Maryland Hospital Global Budget, so I'll leave that to his talk. This is one of my favorite slides about what patient-centered medical home shared savings reimbursement models look like. And let's see. Here we can see that before the PCMH, you've got a distribution of routine preventive care pharmacy service, so outpatient, ph outpatient pharmacy, and then all the inpatient and ED stuff. What you think is going to happen is you'll probably do a little more outpatient care and maybe a little more outpatient pharmacy because people start utilizing the way they're supposed to. But what you get is you get a reduction of the ED visit and hospital uh, care. And the amount of savings you get in the red bar is more than the amount of extra costs you get in the other bars, and you save some money. Then you have to distribute that across all the different elements of the healthcare payer and provider universe. I'm a little unsure how hospital global budgets might change that, because this makes a lot of sense in a fee-for-service universe. I'm a little less clear whether these uh, PCMH shared savings uh, incentives actually survive a global budget environment, and so that's, I think, an unanswered question that we may need to think a little more about. And then finally, this is a model that's uh, referred to in the health department as the Community Integrated Medical Home Model. This was developed as part of a, uh, a grant that the department had from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, their innovation uh, unit, uh, to try to develop uh, an innovation plan and so in, in that planning process, and I think partly informed by where we were heading with HEZ, they uh, conceived of this uh, kind of linkage of the primary care universe uh, and the community health universe as here's all the stuff happening outside of the hospital and how we've got to link the primary care elements, all the community resources. The linkage points are the care managers and the community health workers, and that's all informed by data sharing across, appropriately enough, the cloud, right? since the computers are all going to cloud these days. So I think that represents a, a, an interesting model going forward of what the alliance of the community and the primary care uh, provider network can look like in the future. It's a little bit of what we were trying to get done with HEZs, maybe not quite as explicit as this. And I think this is in some ways the future of trying to do uh, population health or at least kind of ACO kind of population health management. And that's it. <laughs> questions at the end, but are there any questions at this point? Yes, please.
Well, I think the, the starting point for the answer is going to be that it's a great lesson in how the indicator you design for one purpose may not be the right indicator for another purpose. And so the, our selection of the indicators that we use were somewhat based on what metrics do we have that we think are sufficiently unbiased and statistically stable at the single zip code level for us to actually try to rank zip codes for a competitive selection process. So that was kind of what went into the metrics that we picked. Uh, if, and I don't think any of them were necessarily designed with the cumulative toxic environmental exposure, either exposure assessment or outcome assessment related to that in mind. So it, I'm not surprised that, that people wondered how that was relevant because that's probably not the set I would have first thought of if I was trying to do a, a, a ranking system of, of toxic environmental exposure. Uh, <clears throat> I think there you might have to look at at things that might come out of uh, potentially business databases. Where are certain kinds of industries? Where are certain kinds of traffic concentrations? Uh, the whole universe of uh, indicators to think about for that research question that's on the table, uh, I think would potentially be very different from ours and potentially lead to a different set of indicators. So I, I'm not sure I would make the attempt to make the health enterprise zone indicator set work for your research question. I think you need a set that's more designed for that question. All right, thank you very much. I see that uh, Dr. Sharfstein is still not uh, here. Uh, he's on his way. So we're gonna move on now uh, with the next part of the program. Do we know how to get Walt's <laughs> presentation up? I'm good. Uh, so it's my pleasure at this time to introduce Dr. Walter Ettinger. Uh, Dr. Ettinger is the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for the University of Maryland Medical System. His charge in that capacity is to improve clinical quality and patient safety, um, advance population health management, and foster development of uh, physician leadership. Dr. Ettinger received his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and an MBA from Wake Forest University. He has published over 100 manuscripts, 20 book chapters, and three books. Um, his particular expertise um, and the area that he's published extensively in is geriatric medicine and preventive gerontology. He's also held many other um, leadership posts um, in several other academic health centers, which are outlined very nicely in the uh, folder that you all received. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter Ettinger to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, thanks for that gracious introduction. Um, I, one thing I've learned is when you, uh, somebody introduces you and said you've done this and that, it means you're getting old. Uh, so um, what I want to do is uh, talk to you today about how the University of Maryland medical system is approaching population health in the state. And you're going to hear uh, from Dr. Sharfstein in a few minutes about something uh, called the Maryland waiver, which is a big impetus to take Maryland, in my view, from sort of the back of the line to the front of the line in uh, financial, uh, creating the financial incentives for population health. And this is a little cartoon. Uh, and, you know, one of the sort of phrases that gets used a lot is we're moving in healthcare from volume to value. And what that means is that you know, for uh, since the beginning of time, practically, we've been paying for medical care by its inputs. So I get paid for what I do. I don't really get paid for what happens to you uh, as, as a patient. Uh, I don't really, I'm not really held accountable for the outcomes. Fee-for-service medicine, it's called. And it's one of the things, there's many things, but it's one of the things why healthcare is so expensive in the United States. So. I think a lot of people have believed we need to change that and move to a value-based system where uh, physicians and hospitals are responsible for the product that they uh, are, are producing. And so uh, everyone's trying to figure out how to get um, from volume to value with uh, out falling in the water when you have one foot on the dock or one foot on the boat. And in many parts of the country, um, that's still a problem. 
So I, I'm back in Maryland after a, a long hiatus and been in a number of different states. And there are health systems doing population health, but they're still doing fee for service as well. Now the hospital part of this has been all changed in Maryland, which really makes it a lot easier to do. So let me just start by saying, I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about sort of the strategy and business model of how a health system goes about this, but you gotta go back to first principles. This is really about better care and better care at affordable price. You know, healthcare has gotten ridiculously expensive even for people with insurance. Uh, and so we really have an obligation to create value, better outcomes uh, at a lower cost. And that's, our, that's what we're trying to do here. But we have to build that within the system of payment that, uh, that we have. Uh, and, and really, we talk, you heard Dr. Mann talk about resources. This is really about resources and where they go. So what's our strategy at Maryland? Well, our strategy is really to manage more of the premium dollar. So this is a cartoon of uh, how healthcare dollars are spent. Over here is sort of the cost, the insurance piece of it, and then this is all for the medical services, about 85% uh, roughly. Um, hospitals are right here, sort of about 35 uh, to 40% of the healthcare dollar goes to hospitals, and it's big ticket items. So a hospital admission can cost even a simple one can cost $20,000. A complicated one can cost $100,000. So what we're saying is, if we're gonna take responsibility for the outcomes, then we've gotta be able to manage more of the healthcare dollar and integrate all of that care together. Remember, what we have now, uh, it's essentially each one of these buckets and, and, and within the buckets, lots of small buckets, we have a fragmented sort of folks working by themselves. Now that's not entirely true, but to the extent that it uh, affects, we wanna really create that value, we need to do it in a much better way. And the way we're doing it is two ways. One is to actually be an insurance company ourselves. And so we bought a small Medicaid and Medicare insurance company um, so that we're managing now the premium dollar and uh, also as a network of providers to take responsibility for what's paid for by this 85 cents, uh, but also to get that money in, uh, in a, under a contractual way. And I'll talk about how we're gonna do that uh, in a moment. So a couple of principles. Um, when we talk about the cost of healthcare, unless you're at the government level or at the payer level, we really have talked about this, which is sort of the price of care. So we've differentiated this hospital is more expensive than this hospital or this physician's more expensive than that physician. But the total cost of care really depends on the unit costs, how much you do in an episode of care, and then the number of episodes that actually occur. And so under population health, you're not only focusing on this, but you're focusing on these two things as well. And then obviously the total cost of care, a little basic algebra here, is the number of people times the cost per person. So that's one thing that now we're thinking about this in a different way. We've always thought about our unit prices. Second thing uh, to remember about population health when it comes to the dollars, call it the 70-10 rule. And this is, applies to all populations. A small number of people account for uh, a majority of the healthcare costs. So in this population, which was a commercial population, 10% of the people account for 70% of the costs. And the fact is, most people hardly use any healthcare at all, because that's, that's the principle of insurance, right? That people who are well pay for people who are sick. But when you're thinking about how do you manage your population, you really have to focus a lot of your efforts on, on, in this group. And you just heard that, uh, you just heard the same concept talked about uh, in the previous, um, uh, in the previous uh, presentation. So what are the principles of population health uh, from a provider standpoint? Remember, we're, I'm the, I'm, you're viewing this through the lens of a healthcare provider. You get a group of physicians, often in collaboration with other providers, and in our case, it includes hospitals and subacute care and so forth, but physicians are important to lead this effort and to really be driving the effort. 80% of healthcare costs 
uh, are driven by what physicians do. So they got a buy-in. And you take the health care of a population of patients. So remember that uh, pyramid I showed you. So we're going to take a population of patients. Could be Medicare patients, could be uh, a geographic group, it could be an insurer's population, but a population of patients. And then take the responsibility for the triple aim. How many of you have heard the expression triple aim, right? Yeah, so the triple aim of improving the care of individual patients, improving the health of the population, and reducing the per capita cost. And that is sort of where you start. And then you say, okay, I'm going to do this, but you've got to pay me differently. I'm going to be paid. We're going to take risk, if you will. How many of you remember all the risk in managed care back in the 90s? Capitation? A few of you. <laughs> the people with gray hair do. Um, so 20 years ago, we tried this, and it failed miserably. But now we're going to say, we'll take risk-based payments that reward both improvements in quality, that's really critical here, remember, better, better care, uh, and a lower co total cost of care. So what are the core elements of our sort of our population health strategy from a clinical sense? Well, there's five elements to this. One is uh, having these contracts that pay for in a different way. The second is a primary care model that focuses on two things. One is managing that 10% of folks who have mostly chronic diseases. Uh, not all, some, have cat some of that 10% are catastrophic events, cancer, uh, automobile accidents, but a lot of it is chronic disease. Um, and then also improving the quality of the care for the entire population, so two, two foci. Integrating specialists. So if you just do primary care, it won't work because specialists are driving a lot of the actual high-cost care. Third is creating some niche services for really, really vulnerable patients, and would include people with cancer, recurrent cancer in particular, frail elderly, medical psychiatric patients, those with uh, major uh, behavioral health problems, uh, the disabled, chronic kidney disease. So there's a number of niche services that are very expensive to provide, that under fee-for-service don't work, uh, but when you're trying to avoid costs, uh, pay off in the long run. And then lastly, the people have to be in the hospital. You have hospitalists. Hospitalists now are the folks who take care of patients when they're in the hospital. So the primary care provider takes care of the outpatient, hospitalists, and the inpatient, who are very, very good at avoiding unnecessary admissions, managing that admission very carefully, and then managing the transition of care back uh, into the community. So, and what are the tools that we use? And I, I'll just want to say, make a couple of comments about these. Standardization and efficiency of care, reducing unnecessary utilization of diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. What, what, what? we do things that we don't need to do? Well, yes, actually we do. Uh, what's an example of that? Someone comes in to see me, I'm a, I'm a geriatrician, an older person that has some low back pain, uh, has a normal neurological exam, um, uh, has no other system, system uh, symptoms. So an unnecessary test would be to do a, some sort of uh, imaging study like an MRI, just not indicated. So we want to do, we want to do that. We want to avoid the use of the hospital. And you just heard, you just saw a slide where that worked, right? We used other things, outpatient services and pharmacy, but we avoided that expensive hospital. And that's where a lot of the savings comes. When I look at the data in Maryland and I look at the data in uh, areas where care is really managed well, we could reduce the use of our hospitals by 30% in the state, maybe more. Think about that for a moment. That's, that's a pretty stunning statistic. Using the least expensive equivalent, alternative systems of care, practicing team-based care, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, and then engaging patients in shared decision-making. You know, one of the things that we love to do in medicine is tell people what we're going to do for them. So part of this is really engaging the patient, and I'll make another comment about that. So before I go on to this, we said, okay, we want to do all this stuff. We have 12 hospitals, 
$3.5 billion in revenue. Um, we have thousands of doctors affiliated with us. Some we employ, some are employed by the University of Maryland uh, um, School of Medicine. Many are uh, in private practice. How are we gonna do this? So what we said is let's get someone to help us. Let's get someone who's done this before. And so we've engaged a partner, or two partners actually, both who uh, have a real strong clinical bent and both who have proved this concept uh, by doing this on a, on, a, on a pretty large scale. And so we get two things from that. One is their embedded knowledge of how to do this. You know, I think um, I don't have enough time left in my career to just do it by ourselves. And we don't have enough time to respond to the changing environment. So we're engaging someone to help us do this, to really increase our speed to value. So what are we doing? We're making, we're putting together a network. Remember what I said, that group of physicians uh, that will focus on that triple aim and get paid in a different way. And so we're, uh, uh, there's a lot of characteristics here. I won't go through all these. I've talked about a lot of them. But it's taking that network and then saying we're gonna have a populations of patients where we're gonna manage particularly those people that are the sickest and most vulnerable, quality for everyone. And to do that, we're gonna give that network tools. So if I, you know, this was tried before. And, and, and it's been tried in sort of, a, sort of an indirect way. So there's been a lot of vertical integration in healthcare. Health systems are employing physicians, they own home health agencies. And what that basically means is you took all those things and you drew a circle around them and you said, okay, uh, let's integrate the care. Well, that it just isn't enough. You have to give tools to people uh, to make that work. So we're building what we're calling a population health services organization that pr provides a set of tools, people, care managers, pharmacists, social workers, people to focus on that high risk group, um, programs and processes, and technology down here. Technology that allows you to really keep uh, real-time track of both the quality and cost of care. Really critical piece of this. And the electronic health records that we've spent billions of dollars on don't do this. I only know from, we use a system called Epic at the University of Maryland. If someone goes outside of our system, we don't know how, we don't have access to those data about what happens. So this allows, we need a system that will aggregate that data, claims data, pharmacy data, clinical data. So here's what it looks like, a little cartoon. Patient in the center, physician, and then this team around them, and then this medical neighborhood, if you will, in a medical home, not necessarily a medical home where you check off the boxes, but a medical home where they practice in a different way, supported by this population health services organization. It's a big undertaking. We think it'll take us five years to uh, get this up and running uh, and, and uh, doing this very well. Two years to set it up, uh, another three years to really improve uh, our processes and get the outcomes we want. And by the way, we need to really evaluate what we're doing. And so we have incredible intellectual capital with our partners at the School of Medicine. And so we've invited uh, the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health to work with us on an evaluation piece of this. And we're uh, uh, not only in setting up, uh, did we get the right outcomes from what we're doing, but also helping us uh, design these interventions. So let me just talk a little bit about a couple of, uh, th four things uh, in a little bit of detail. First of all is complex care management. This is the management of those uh, people at risk. And uh, it includes people with complex disease, multiple chronic diseases. It includes transitions of care. So when people go from one uh, setting to another, particularly from into the inpatient setting and out of the inpatient setting. Pharmacy and therapeutics and quality monitoring. 
Uh, it requires uh, a fair number of people to do that. That's quite expensive, and so really important to target these interventions to the people who can benefit. It's really important. It's not just everybody that has multiple chronic illnesses. And by the way, this approach is a, is a holistic approach. It's not simply about the, the medical piece of that. That's very important. But as you've heard uh, in the previous, um, from the previous speaker, health disparities, social situations, concomitant uh, behavioral health problems all have to be addressed in this approach. Uh, the IT capabilities we we're talking about, and we are, uh, our partners bringing us a system that incorporates data from multiple sources, uh, as I said earlier, the insurer, pharmacy data, clinical data, uh, data from CRISP, they get the hospital ADT, which is the admission, discharge, and transfer data, which uh, is done almost in real time, predictive analytics to determine who's at risk, performance data on quality and cost. We can re get down to the individual patient level and physician level uh, and, and then aggregate those data. And then importantly, this is where the care management module, this comprehensive care management sits and the care managers use this uh, as a way to communicate with other providers. Another piece that I wanna emphasize to you is practice transformation. Um, remember, we have, we are dealing with a system that was created, again, let's just go back to 50 years to the creation of Medicare, which really kind of fueled our system as it is today. And so not only do we have this payment system fee for service, but we all learned how to take care of patients in the system. And so we need to change behavior. So one of the things we're doing is practice transformation, getting performance improvement people to go into the practices and help the physicians and their teams really use these tools in a different way. And here's some of the areas of emphasis. And again, they should look familiar uh, uh, given uh, what uh, David said earlier. Use of data and registries, quality data, assuring the availability of practice to patients. By the way, how many of you have needed to go to your uh, physician uh, you called, you needed an appointment that day, or you needed to talk to someone or see someone on off hours and you couldn't do it. Uh, everybody should raise their hand, <laughs> or you haven't gone to a doctor. Uh, you know, one of the things you have to do is have access, and that means 24-7 access. Um, and some of that can be done telephonically, but you really need to have hours uh, on the weekends and on the evenings so people can get in to be seen. Um, Embedding practice guidelines, expanding span of in-office procedures, oops, uh, patient and family engagement, shared decision making, uh, creating teams uh, and managing these transitions of care. These are the kinds of skill sets that we want to help teach uh, the physicians and their teams to do. And I think this is a real differentiator. One of the reasons that you get so much variation in patient-centered medical homes and other practices is that uh, you have very smart people, but they don't have the skill sets they need to, to make the change. And then the other thing is targeting. Uh, and, you know, this gets a little bit um, difficult because we want to get, have all services to all people that need them. Uh, and what you really want to do is target these services to people that will benefit from them. And that doesn't mean there are some people that, for one reason or another, won't. And so the information system we had can actually predict using a, a risk stratification algorithm. Uh, you can classify people to their risk for poor quality or unnecessary utilization. So that's another aspect to this. And what that allows you to do and what this slide shows you is remember, here's, here is people with simple chronic disease managed by the PCP, self-management health education programs. And as you go up this pyramid, you're talking about sicker and sicker people and people who are using more and more of the healthcare dollar because we don't have a system that works for them. So at the top, you have people actually being managed at home. And I'm not talking about home health nursing alone. I'm talking about actually caring for people in their homes. Now, I've said this a couple times, but I want to say it one more time. Uh, we have a great habit in healthcare of designing systems for people and then wondering why they're not happy with this. And um, 
this shared decision making, this engagement of people, and winning trust is very important. And who, how many of you know Arnie Milstein? A couple do. He's a, he's a professor at Stanford. He's an a internist and a really thoughtful person. And someone asked him, what's population health all about? And he really said three things. Actually, he said a fourth, and I'll tell you what that is. Identify the patients most at risk, build them a new delivery system, like we've talked about, and win their trust. Because if people don't feel engaged or that they're trusted or you're creating value for them, all this is for naught. And he said one more thing, and keep them out of the hands of well-meaning hospitals and specialists. <laughs> so this has really got to be a big part of what we're doing. So let me just summarize uh, by saying here's our strategy. Uh, we're going to go all in, and we're in it for the long haul and we're putting a lot of uh, resources into building the system, tens of millions of dollars. Engage an operating partner. Involve physicians to lead that transformation uh, in care delivery. I'm fond of telling my uh, colleagues in the hospital, um, I know we are an odd bunch, us doctors, and we're hard to deal with, but you've got to be willing to give the physicians the keys to the car and let them drive. Build a business case that achieves management of an increasing percentage of the healthcare dollar. Measure efficacy and effectiveness and always adhere to the first principles. This isn't about making money. And luckily, we're a not-for-profit health system. We don't have shareholders. We need an operating margin to keep to reinvesting in our business. But in the end, it's better care at an affordable price for the citizens of Maryland. Thank you. I'm really thrilled that Dr. Uh, Sharfstein is here. Um, I, I have known uh, Dr. Sharfstein in two ways. One, I met him formally when I was dean of the school, and he was secretary of Maryland Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene. But I also follow him on Twitter, and that allows me to learn a whole host of new things about Dr. Sharfstein that you don't ordinarily know. Uh, one is, is that he tweets about everything, and the other is he really loves the Baltimore Orioles uh, and, and keeps everybody apprised of what's going on. Currently, Dr. Sharfstein is Associate Dean and oversees the Office of Public Health Practice and Training and the General uh, Preventive Medicine Residency Program and Practice Activities at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, and also that includes collaborating with public health agencies throughout the state and beyond. Uh, previous to that, he was secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and before that, principal deputy commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and, uh, uh, and then before that, commissioner of health for Baltimore City. And before that, he had another job that I always wondered how this happened. I always wondered why Henry Waxman was such a pro-health member of Congress. Now I think I know, and that is because the Dr. Sharfstein serves as a principal, served as a principal advisor for uh, uh, Henry Waxman when he, uh, when he was uh, prior to all these other positions. Really happy to say that he's here today to tell us about Maryland's all-payer approach to health care delivery. Dr. Sharfstein. <clears throat> that sound you hear while I'm talking will be my car getting towed somewhere on the campus. So um, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see so many people. For, just so you know, uh, you can join uh, Professor Gold and my mother and follow me on Twitter if you want, <laughs> at, at Dr. Josh S. Um, I wanted, uh, I'm sorry that I missed Dr. Mann's uh, talk, but I have great respect for him and all the work that he's done, an incredible amount of work on so many different issues, and uh, with an incredible passion in Maryland. Um, I did hear uh, Dr. Editor's presentation, and it almost brought tears to my eyes, frankly, because it is, I, if, I, if you had gone back in time five years and said, you're going to be hearing a you know, CMO of a major health system in Maryland talk about their future plans, and he's going to be talking about health and how to get there. I might 
not have believed it. Um, and not because of Maryland, but, but just because of where the healthcare system was. And the transformation and the vision that you heard is just an incredible uh, positive statement about uh, him and the University of Maryland. Um, I was so um, willing to support the University of Maryland that I let them take my chief of staff a few months before I left, uh, who I think works with Dr. Edinger and is doing a great job. So what is this all about? And I'm going to talk about no slides, if that's OK, with everybody. Um, I'm on a uh, slides-free bender for the moment here. Um, but uh, I think uh, I'm going to just make one general point and then talk about population health and how it intersects with this system. The fundamental premise behind what, we're tr what we tried to do when I was at the state and what the state is still trying to do um, is shift from thinking about healthcare and health from a mindset of quality to a mindset of outcome. What is the difference between quality and outcome? So a lot of people conflate them. They use quality half the time and outcome half the time, depending on what they did in the previous sentence. But I think of them as two very different concepts. We all want quality health care when we're sick. You know, we want to make sure we get the aspirin if we're having a heart attack or we're you know, getting uh, the right kind of outpatient treatment for asthma. That's very, very important. That's quality. And there's a huge movement in healthcare for quality. And five years ago, if you'd heard a chief medical officer talk, they would largely be focused on quality. They would say, here are all the initiatives we're doing to make sure you get the best possible care. And, I'm, and I know those initiatives are still going. And there's very high quality care in a lot of places. Um, but it is all about the, you start with the assumption that you have a sick patient there and you're thinking about the quality of care provided for them. When I use the term outcome, I think of how do we have a healthy group of people? How do we structure health services and other types of services so that we have a population that is experiencing a good health outcome? So maybe we're not having the heart attacks or maybe we're not having the asthma admissions and a, a great measure of outcome, I think, for example, is preventable hospitalizations. How many hospitalizations in a population really were unnecessary had the person been able to get the right kind of preventive treatment? That's not exact, maybe that's partly quality, but it's not really quality. It's really an outcome measure of the health of the population. You don't want people getting admitted again and again and again. When I was the city health department, we managed to get uh, some data showing we had just incredible incredibly high rates of preventable hospitalizations in, in Baltimore. Um, even at the same time, and, and I said at the time, I think, that if you're really sick, it's, you know, you're going to get great care in Baltimore. But if you really are looking for people who want to are, are able to stay healthy, we may not be the front of the pack with some understatement. Um, and so uh, how do you change payment from focusing on quality to outcomes. So for a long time, there have been you know, extra little payments or different things if there's higher quality. Um, and there are all these websites that track quality. And they should continue to do that. But how do you switch it to outcome? It's not so obvious. In Maryland, we stumbled in a way. We had the good fortune of having a, a very unique system that we could take and turn towards outcome. Uh, in the, w the way that we paid. And basically, um, without getting into too much detail, Maryland's the only state that sets hospital rates. For a long time, that really looked like giving hospitals a rate card. Each hospital had its own rate card, different set of rates by hospital. But once a hospital had a rate card, everybody paid that rate. If you were in Medicare, Medicare paid the rate. If you had an uh, appendectomy, the appendectomy rate was the same rate paid by Medicare, by Blue Cross, by Kaiser, by United, by Medicaid. And if you were uninsured, you'd get charged a bill for exactly that same rate. So everyone paid the same rate. It was largely a fee-for-service um, system. What we switched about a, maybe two years ago now was we switched that to say instead of just having a rate card where everything's paid, and, and so there was a lot done on quality, um, through that system, we switched to the concept that we want hospitals to do better if their communities are healthier. We're going to be paying not based on a fee-for-service idea, but we're going to give essentially a global budget to the hospitals 
and they're going to be able to use some of that money to prevent illness from happening in the first place, and that they could actually lower the number of preventable admissions and keep the difference on the back end. And uh, that's the concept. That is the, the basic concept, and we had to get a special waiver to be able to do it in Maryland, and Maryland is now, um, I think more than 98% of the hospital revenue is not being paid fee-for-service for Maryland residents, but is rather shifted to a more global type of payment. And the changes that come to that are, are, are very interesting and very important for, for population health. So I think the first change that happens is you, ha you see terrific people like Dr. Edinger getting hired because the health systems need to have some sensibility about what to do to keep their population healthy. If, you know, the typical way, I, I had a hospital CEO say to me um, when I was the state health secretary that he was retiring. Uh, that I'd really pushed him out. I was the final straw. And I asked him, you know, why, why is that? And he said, well, for 50 years, I have walked to my office through the cafeteria. And if the cafeteria was bustling, I knew we were doing well. I had a skip in my step. I went right to my desk. If the cafeteria was not doing well, I would make a few calls. How are we doing? Anything I should be worried about? What's going on? And they go, no problem, boss. We'll figure out how to make sure the hospital's more full, because that's what they needed to survive. Now he says, I don't know whether they're readmissions, I don't know whether they're preventable admissions under this new system, I don't know who should be in the cafeteria, who shouldn't be in the cafeteria, the hell with it, basically, you know. He said it in a nice way, I think he appreciated the transition, but said there needs to be a new generation of people who are thinking about how to make use of these very different types of incentives, where Maryland really is unique in, in that regard. And so the first thing that's happening are people are coming in and saying, let's think about how to keep our sickest patients healthier. Not just, you know, and, and that could be someone who's been in the hospital every month, they're quite an ill patient, but why are they in the hospital every month? You know, what, what's, oftentimes I, I would use the example of a patient in heart failure where their fluid level is just at the brink and they might have a few pieces of pizza and their salt level intake would go up and the fluid would go up and then they couldn't breathe, they need to be admitted. And those patients get admitted an awful lot. Well, what does it take to really stabilize someone like that at home so that they don't have to come in? You know, and before, if the hospital's getting paid every single time the patient comes in, then there's not a huge incentive for the patient to, to really help that patient. But now, the, the hospital's on a global budget, they'll keep the difference if they can figure out a way to keep that patient healthier at home. So that's where you see, I think, a lot of the great initiatives you heard about from Dr. Edinger, thinking about the sickest patients, how to help them, what kinds of services work. And I think in doing that, you could imagine, if I had one slide, it would be like concentric circles. On the inside of that circle, it's just, fundamentally caring or, or having the incentive to prevent unnecessary hospitalizations, keep that patient from struggling to breathe. The next circle around that is finding those patients in your system, which isn't that easy, or in the state. The next circle around that is figuring out what can be done from a medical perspective, because oftentimes these patients, as you heard, may bounce around the system and nobody's really responsible for them, but having them have a primary care doctor who cares about them and a team that cares about them. There's a lot on the medical side. That's where I think Dr. Enger was talking about around practice transformation. But now we can keep going out another circle and say, how do you really help those individual patients? And it may be, as I'm sure many people here are aware, that what's the real reason that person keeps eating pizza and coming in is that that's all they can get for food and what else can we get for them to get for food and what kind of partnerships can we have to help address some of the other poor causes of health to help that person not come back in and you're seeing the I think quite an interesting dialogue happen across the state and I know in the next panel you'll be hearing for some public health leaders talking about that about how to link up the hospital discussion and the focusing on the medical management with some of those broader social issues that will affect. And now I'll go one more circle, because I want to have time for the discussion here. And that is, we don't just care about the individual patients, but we want to think about how to make the community healthier so that a whole bunch of people inside the community. And I think that that's a little bit in the future, that full integration, but the system is really moving toward that. You're, you see that that first inner circle has been accomplished. 
the hospitals, like Dr. Edinger said, are working with the other parts of the healthcare system to take better care of the patients in this regard. And then you've got um, a bunch of uh, regional partnerships forming around the state where they're thinking about the social needs of patients. And a, lo a lot of these regional partnerships will put in applications to the hospital system for funding. And it's in their vision, they're thinking about that. And then you go a little bit further out. And I think you have the idea that we can be thinking about um, healthier uh, neighborhoods and ways to invest in that. And I think it creates, not all that's the hospital's responsibility. It's in fact, all the people who are working in population health and health and related fields have to be there to partner with the hospitals to be able to do that. But I think that, that that's part of the um, issue. How many people here saw the University of Maryland Students Project on West Baltimore, uh, the journalism project? Yeah, it's, I would say required reading probably for everybody here if we can get the link out. You know, very interesting uh, discussion of uh, the challenges to stay healthy in West Baltimore. And one of the stories that was really uh, brutal to read was about a woman who was trying to get a blood pressure cuff. We just lived right there in West Baltimore and, and it took her like six hours with the buses to try to figure out how to get to the pharmacy and get a blood pressure cuff and they didn't have it. And you know, it was just, it was just incredible explanation of how, you know, I think that as we think about what it takes to really help people get be healthy, there is certainly the idea that somebody would find that person in the future and help them get a blood pressure cuff. But I think even better is that you would think that you would see people coming together and a big role for public health, partnering with hospitals to make uh, the community a place where a lot of people could get blood pressure cuffs or that even fewer people need a blood pressure cuffs uh, because of uh, different steps that could be taken. So I think that there, you know, it's, uh, if you look at how far we have to go, it can be pretty disheartening. But I certainly have seen from five years back to now a just drastic shift in the way that um, the healthcare system is thinking in Maryland. And I think there's every reason for people working in the state to be very excited and positive about the opportunities. Doesn't mean anything's gonna be easy, but I think that um, it makes, it's what makes this um, uh, type of event uh, so great. So thank you for having me. I wanna thank Dean Clark and Dean Kleinman for inviting me and look forward to the discussion. I think we have uh, about 10 minutes left on the here on <laughs> about 10 minutes left for your questions to uh, doctors uh, Sharpstein, Mann, and Ettinger regarding population health and the presentations. Uh, we'll try and pass around a microphone. There's a question right here in the fifth row. Uh, thank you very much um, for the talk. It was really engaging and fascinating. Uh, I'm very excited and that um, efforts are being made in Baltimore. I'm from University of Maryland Baltimore campus. And um, I have a question about um, provider engagement. So we always talk about patient engagement, community engagement, but in many cases, in some cases, indeed clinicians, providers that practice in Baltimore and other areas are left behind because they are not really well informed what we are trying to do. You know, I'm in research setting, so I know what we are trying to do, but many doctors don't have a time to, well, not only doctors now, we are talking about nurse practitioners and other providers, and these people might not be really aware of what they can do, the contributions that they can make and to improve the population health. Uh, so if you have any um, efforts that you are making or any idea, that would be really great to hear. Thank you. Would one of you like to, sure, Dr. I'll, Ettinger? I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. So I, I think it's a great question, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, first of all, uh, if you think back to what I said, I think we have to have the providers, the physicians, and by the way, broaden that to include nurse practitioners and other advanced practice providers. And, and you know what? Particularly in the primary care level, they're embattled. They are very frustrated. I have never seen uh, in my 40 years of being a physician uh, sort of the dis 
you know, the frustration of having to do all these activities that don't add value. And I think uh, I'd answer your question in two ways. One is we want to say to folks, uh, we want to bring the joy back to practicing medicine. Uh, it, is a wonderful, it is a wonderful thing to do, as you know. Uh, and that's why people went in in the first place. And so we want to put systems in place that allow you to be successful. Number two is we've got to give you the skill sets to do that. Just simply saying go do it uh, can create even more frustration. So I think that that's a really important part. And lastly, as I said earlier, I think um, it, it's really important to, uh, to let the physicians be making and in teams be making the decisions about how this a transformation is going to occur. So it's really an engagement strategy, if you will, particularly around primary care, but also involving the specialists. I have to say, I've been doing uh, clinical transformation with doctors for 25 years. They, you know, the vast majority of them want to do the right thing. I think you put the right incentives in place, and that's the last thing I'll say. Primary care providers under the system make uh, quite a bit more money because you're paying them for quality and you're reimbursing them for the things that they do for managing that total cost of care. Any other thoughts before I turn to another question? All right, any other, yes, right here. Hi, Rebecca Rear, uh, Maryland Environmental Health Network. Um, I did just wanna sort of follow up on the, the question I had asked earlier. Um, the reason that we were using the health enterprise zone criteria um, as indicators is because we know that um, a lifetime of exposure to non-chemical stressors like poverty and um, racial discrimination actually influences a population's ability to respond to additional chemical stressors um, so that uh, a permit application from the Department of the Environment may deserve additional scrutiny if being proposed in a community that suffers disproportionately from um, what we identify as non-chemical stressors. And I was just wondering about um, getting input from the panel about how to get um, these environmental and chemical exposures in, in the broader dialogue on population health. Um, because I think we, when we talk about environment, we think about walkability, we think about transportation, and those are absolutely critical and important, um, but we don't often talk about the chemical exposures um, and the disproportionate um, exposure to low-income and populations of color, um, and that there's some brilliant research in my in, at, going on here at Maya, if I do say so as an alum, um, on, on chemical exposures, but how do we get that in the um, broader dialogue of, of population health? Uh, Dr. Sharfstein? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. I actually was just finishing giving a lecture on Flint, Michigan which has uh, sort of certainly put in the headlines a major environmental health issue. Um, I think people do appreciate safe food, safe air, safe water as being very important. Um, I think it's generally speaking, um, public health in general hasn't been very valued. You know, public health has always been the teeny sliver of the, the, the circle of funding. But I do think that that is changing in part because of the major changes going on in healthcare. I think it's changing because of other different things that are going on. And I think that you can't do public health without environmental health and thinking about you know, a, a, a broad, broad approach. So I think it's both the general point that, that as people care more about public health, it will naturally happen. And I also think it will be, uh, you'll see just like with Flint and all the follow-ups that are happening with Flint, that there's um, more attention paid to this, these types of questions. Dr. Mann. Are you familiar with the DHMH Environmental Public Health Tracking website? Because that's probably one source to try to get some sense of what's going on with environmental exposures at the community level. Sometimes I think we do suffer from a granularity problem. If you've got air quality monitors, do you have enough of them out there to really be able to figure out whether this zip code or this census tract has a meaningfully different exposure level to pick your favorite PM whatever uh, versus another neighboring area. So uh, we, we may sometimes suffer from not having that degree of, of specificity to small geographies. I think the, the notion of do you want to roll in the general health of the population as potentially a factor in do you decide to put something in that might be an environmental stressor is a kind of interesting kind of 
citing decision making uh, question. And so I suppose from that perspective, the criteria for the HEZ program might be relevant because that's not so much specific to the environmental question, but it's, well, we know that this is already a burden community and we want to add one more burden. Thank you. Back here. That was a terrific presentation about um, population health management, which mostly was focused on um, the covered lives that are involved in your health system. But going to Dr. Sharfstein's point, um, what philosophically do you think is the responsibility of Maryland's major health systems to address the broader level population health concerns of the geographical community in which you operate? Um, realizing that it can eat up all your resources pretty quickly, but I, I'm just wondering what you think your role is. And related to that, uh, does the community health needs assessment affect either your population health management plans or the larger population health questions in the community? Yeah, it, th thank you, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I think we can't, first of all, we can't do everything. And so I think one thing we need to do more is partner. You know, we've, we've, we've within, within the sort of the, traditional medical community, we haven't done that. Now we gotta get outside that. And I think, I think Josh made that point very well. So, you know, and we have to be leaders because we, we're big and we have a lot of resources, relatively speaking. Um, but I wanna say one thing, and that is, you know, we have to be realistic about the finances of this. And so one reason that we're taking the approach that I, that I outlined for you is it generates the revenue to pay for this pretty quickly. If you can take that group of people that's most at risk and avoid unnecessary utilization, the savings then are available to put in place more of these, more and more of these programs. And, and one thing that I didn't say, uh, I, I, I think I intimated, but I didn't say is, you have people with rising risk, right? So we're, we're focused on the top of that pyramid. We've got to use resources to focus on those folks, diabetics, people with hypertension, chronic diseases, uh, social issues, uh, uh, behavioral health issues that could be treated at a much earlier stage. Up to this point, we've had, you know, there's really no way to pay for that. So I think it's sort of first things first, but I, uh, I accept your challenge that we have a major responsibility for forming those partnerships and taking a broader role in the communities we serve. And you know, for the University of Maryland, we're all over the state, but we are a big provider in West Baltimore, and, and, and Lord knows there's, you know, incredible needs in that community. I think we have two more people and then we'll have to call it quits. One up here. Sure. Well, well, I'm sorry. Well, it's Dr. okay. Well, while you're coming with the mic, I'll just say that I, I think that the, the other side of the coin there is it's a, an opportunity in the meantime for public health and for the, you know, public health to try to offer to partner in different ways. Thank you. I'm Jim Curry. I represent the officers in the U.S. Public Health Service, both active and retired. Uh, Dr. Mann, you mentioned, if I remember correctly, that there was a relatively small population of people percentage-wise who account for a very large percentage of emergency room visits. And uh, I've, I've seen newspaper articles to that effect in, in many jurisdictions and all. And then Dr. Edinger, you mentioned that 10% of the population accounts for about 70% of healthcare costs. Are those two part of an overlapping group or are they distinct from each other? And then the second part of it is, in, in your group of 10%, how much of that 70% of cost, uh, with you being the, the geriatrician that you are, is accounted for by end of, end of life costs uh, on the part of a fairly small percentage of the population? So uh, maybe we should both answer your first question. Correct. I think they're really, we're really saying the same thing. There's sim okay. similar populations. Uh, that there are a, a group of people for a whole host of reasons that use a disproportionate share of healthcare services. Um, I'll, I'll answer your second question and let, uh, just to be efficient. Uh, end of life care and uh, advanced care planning is really important because it's good medicine. Uh, there are certainly avoidable costs um, that can uh, be mitigated by that, but it's not as much as you might think. Uh, it's important, though, because it's really important to the patient and to the family that we have conversations about what are your goals, what are the treatments you want, what are the trade-offs you're willing to make uh, towards the end of life. One last question. Thank you. Uh, Jane Lipscomb from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. 
So I'm troubled by maybe Dr. Sharfstein's comment about you know, the responsibility for community health. And I'm not quite sure where those incentives lie. At one point in time, I was very hopeful that with the ACA's, you know, um, increased scrutiny of non-for-profit healthcare centers having to demonstrate, you know, how they're spending that money that we might see more of that trickling into, you know, really community-based grassroots efforts. And I don't think I see that yet. So should I give up? <laughs> um, you know, I, I never really had too much of that hope on, based on the IRS stuff. Yeah. I'm not, I, I was always a bit of a skeptic on that. And that is in part because I saw how under a fee-for-service system, you know, to a certain extent that um, was used as a sort of marketing budget, not so much for, but you know, it, it really was part of the overall financial incentives. And I was once in a room, I'll, I, it looks like I'm being recorded, but I'll say it anyway, where people were trading stories of like, this is like, uh, can you top this in terms of the craziest expenses that people put down. This was a national, I'm not talking about Maryland. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the Ooh, craziest expenses. And, and one person said um, that uh, there was a hospital that was um, uh, sending teams to churches to scan people's necks to see who they could line up in the operating room as community benefit, even though it's not recommended to do asymptomatic screening. And then the next person said, I think I can top that. We, we had our director um, judge the state beauty pageant and charged his hotel for that experience as part of the community benefit for the hospitals. All right, that wins. You know, that, you can't beat that one. So it, if the hospital is based fundamentally paid on fee-for-service, it's, it's extraordinary. And there are some hospitals that still do a good job despite that. They, they do, you know, I, but, so I don't want to say that it never happens, but I became quite a cynic about that. If, on the other hand, you can align the hospital's overall incentive with the health of the community, then you're not just talking about their community benefit plan. You're talking about their whole mission. And... I think in Maryland we've accomplished a lot of that alignment. Now that does not mean that the hospitals have suddenly found all this money to just toss out to uh, all kinds of ideas that seem good. It does mean that they're really working, I think, to reorient their care around patients who are seriously ill. It does mean that they're participating in these collaboratives. And in fact, the health, even if the individual hospitals haven't maybe as much, the overall system is investing in regional collaborations that really get to some of the social issues. And I think you're establishing a platform for over time to be able to move in that area. But you really have to look for the systems like Dr. Edinger, where he says, we want to go at risk, where we actually win if the patient's outcome is better, not just the quality. We want to win if the patient's outcome is better. And th that's where people have to come in and partner. And I think the answer is that people probably won't necessarily be knocking on your door, but you, if you knock on their door, you're going to have a much better conversation than before, and over time, hopefully, that will turn into meaningful partnerships. I want to thank my uh, uh, co... Oh, I'm sorry. Is another, another comment? Yeah, since my dissertation Dr. advisor Mann. was a health economist, I osmosed <laughs> some of that from him. And I've thought a lot about one of the things we struggle with in health disparities is often the people who benefit when you reduce health disparities, particularly in utilization, aren't the people who are paying the cost of the thing that saves them the money. And that disconnect between who's making the investment and who's reaping the reward is such a problem in medicine. And I think that potentially one of the unintended consequences of global budgets is when you set a global budget, you've locked in a cost savings to all the payers. And maybe those payers need to be required to throw some money into the community because otherwise the hospital is tr struggling with the fact that when you reduce volume in short in small increments, you don't save a lot of money because there's an awful lot of fixed costs. There's probably pretty small marginal costs. And I think we've got some, some bugs to iron out in how the flows of the savings and the investments work in our new model. I want to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Kay Tracy from University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, and ask you to join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Sharfstein, Dr. Mann, and Dr. Ettinger. Thank you very much.